Happy New Year, Paul. Happy New Year, Seamus. Thank you. It is a pretty happy new year. Yeah, we're having a good time here too. I don't know, there's, there's something weird about it. It's just like, new year and like, everything seems better. Everything's the same, but it seems better. I have um, a tiny thing that is really stupid that makes my new year a little less happy. Um, a few days ago, my nephew stopped in to pick some stuff up and I didn't need to meet with him at all. He just came into the basement, but I just sort of like, hey, it's my nephew, and I greeted him. And then he mentioned that his dad was sick. He, oh, he's like, my dad couldn't come, he's sick. I'm like, oh. And then, you know, the mention of sickness is reminded me, hey, there, there's a pandemic going on. You shouldn't be socializing with people up close. I didn't hug him or anything, but we were in the same room. We were like, you know, one meter away from each other. So I was like, hey, yeah, Merry Christmas. I'll see you later. And then the next day, he wasn't feeling well. And they got tested and they are COVID positive. And they're in the depths of it now. So Yikes. So you've been exposed. It, I have been exposed, but it was like a meter away for 90 seconds, you know, before I right. sort of remembered. So it's like, uh, that was, how risky was that? I don't know. But now, and I'm fine right now, except every time I cough or sniffle, or like, <clears throat> I'm like, wait, that seemed to, is that, is that just a regular cough? Or am I, is that, is this it? Wait, was that cough drier than usual? Can I still taste right. my tongue? <laughs> right. I've been like sniffing things. Do I still have a sense of smell? Because that's supposedly one of the um, early onset symptoms is you lose your sense of smell. But my sense of smell barely works to begin with. <laughs> right. It's been gone for years. And you always right. sniffle and you're always coughing. It's like a low level, but like, you know, a little bit. Exactly. I'm just, I'm an asthmatic with lots of allergies and no sense of smell. And so I am just absolutely paranoid. Every time I clear my throat, I think, oh, this is it. Because I'm one of the people that's at, you know, high risk. My lungs are mostly scar tissue at this point from just years of asthma attacks and stuff. So I would not be in great shape if, if this thing were to really hit me. So that's what I got for the new year is a few days of paranoia. A few days? Aren't you supposed to be paranoid for like... A week? Two weeks? Yeah, yeah, I guess a few, this was several days ago we became... So, I'm like on day three of paranoia. So, I've okay. got, you know, several more... Eh, I've got several more days of paranoia to get through. We're in kind of a similar situation. There's a cold going around, and then one of the family members that we saw during uh, Christmas time has tested positive for COVID and sounds like, well, is this it or is it not it or what's going on? Um, but all the testing sites here are just jam packed. There's like four hours of waiting or whatever. And uh, so we're just going to quarantine and see what happens. That's what we're doing. Yep. I've just decided for the next few days, I'm just going to stay in my office and play video games and not leave the house. Um, so a, a very unusual start to the new year, right. but sometimes yeah, you have to do it for the good of society. Right. Basically continuing the inadvertent quarantine I've been doing since like 2012. <laughs> right. I was way ahead of this. So we have many mailbag questions this week. I complained last week, Hey, the mailbag's empty. And so people sent in questions. So let's do this. Seamus. This one actually wasn't sent to Diecast. This was sent to my personal email, but I want, I, I've gotten several of these over the last few months, so I'm going to handle it on the Diecast. Seamus. Where did Bob Case go? His, his article series appeared to have stopped abruptly. Also, a couple of his videos are now gone, presumably due to copyright takedowns. Dragon Age 2 and Shandification of Fallout. Damn it, that's one of my favorites. 
These should be in the Criterion Collection, but now I'm worried the copyright issues may never be resolved, or the videos never re-uploaded, becoming lost forever to the sands of time. Michael. So, yeah. Bob Case um, did email me at some point a few months ago. And... Um, Mentioned he needed to take a hiatus. He didn't say why. And I have not heard from him since. I prodded him once. And I just wanted, you know, hey, no pressure. I don't want to pressure him. Like, even though I really would love to see more content from him, I don't want to be some kind of asshole that's like, hey, Bob, you're going to write me some more content for my website? What the heck, dude? <laughs> What's your problem? Right. I'm entitled to more work for you, from you. So I, I wanted to be very gentle. And I also know how, how horrible a motivator the guilt is. If you feel guilty for not doing something, it makes you less, or for a lot of creative people, feeling guilty makes you less likely, likely to work on something. Right. Yeah, same so, way with me. It's like, if, if I need to finish something then I need to have some motivation, some sort of positive motivation. The negative motivation just keeps me away from engaging with it at all. Right. So I didn't want to like, hey, you know, there are a lot of people out there waiting for your next post. You really left everybody hanging. Um, I, didn't, I definitely didn't want to do that. So I gave him one gentle reminder, just like, hey, man, you are always welcome here, which he is. He's just, he's a great creator. And... He, he, I would be standing in his shadow um, if, if he was a, a more prolific creator. The only thing keeping him from being a superstar is that his output's kind of slow. Probably because he has, like, real-life obligations. He has a full-time job and stuff. So, right. I don't know what happened to him. If, um, if he shows up again, I will let everybody know. <laughs> I'm always glad to see his work, but he's apparently retreated into his own projects or life. I wish him the best. I've got a, a friend like that who's not on the internet at all. He's a very private person, but very creative, uh, but also doesn't like doesn't have a high output. So he'll be working on something and you know you know work on it for a year or two, and then he'll be like, hey, here's the thing I made, or. Or usually even, it's not even like he doesn't volunteer it. It's just like, I'll be talking to him. And you're like, oh yeah, I did this thing. You're like, wow, that's so cool. Like, why does no one know about this? Well, you know, I don't want to say right. anything. don't want to draw attention to myself. And uh, Bob seems like kind of maybe that kind of same kind of person where he's like, eh, I'm doing stuff, but I don't really want to like make a big deal of, of myself. Right. He creates things because he needs to. He's not like, he is not the sort of person that's like, hey, I need to feed the content mill. He's like, he's not going to make a video unless he's got something really pushing on him. Yeah. Hi. First of all, Happy New Year. Second of all, I don't really have any good questions. Okay. Too busy playing Cyberpunk 2077. Okay, and analyzing. Fine, fine. But I'm actually curious, and it's probably as appropriate as any. I remember you, Seamus, talking about John Wick and action movies in general a long time ago. So what action movies of the last decade that you, A like the most, B, hate, and C, consider underrated. Same set of questions to Paul. Best regards, Deadly Dark. Thank you, Deadly Dark. Seamus, what are your favorite, least favorite, and underrated action movies? Okay. I'm going to take them... Like, I'm not going to list my favorite Marvel movies, because I, I like most of the Marvel movies, and I don't want to clutter up this list. Like, everybody likes them... They don't stick with you for a long time. They're roller coasters. You get on the roller coaster, you have a great time, and then you stop thinking about it, right? You, you, you know, none of they're really, really well-made roller coasters. Yeah, it's not even on the level of the Matrix where it's like, yeah, but what if we are in a simulation? It's just right. popcorn fun. Exactly. Really good popcorn fun, not stupid. Stupid popcorn fun. But okay, so I did make a list of all the the movies I really loved in the in the last uh, 10 years. 
I've probably forgotten a few. This was a hastily constructed list, but I'm just going to rattle them off and then talk about a couple. The Raid Redemption, Moneyball, Argo, Dread, Molly's Game, Founder, Blade Runner 2049, Logan Lucky, and John Wick. Just the whole John Wick thing. We don't need to like... I actually don't think I've seen the most recent one. I need to do that. Okay, so the ones I really want to talk about here that are underrated. Here, here, are, here are ones that I think are underrated and that I'm surprised they didn't make a bigger deal. The Raid Redemption is an Indonesian martial arts film. And for me, it was kind of like John Wick. In I mean, the movies are nothing alike, but that's sort of like when you're watching the first John Wick movie and you're like, whoa, I've never seen a movie take its choreography this seriously before. Like, just take it to this level where you feel like everybody's a professional. This isn't like... You've got two good stuntmen and then shaky cam. You just get by on shaky cam and stuntmen. This, the raid felt like everybody on screen knew how to fight, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Every, it's Indonesian and their martial arts. This is the first time I've seen, oh, it's probably not the first time, but it's the, one of the first Indonesian uh, martial arts movies I've ever seen. And, wow, it just felt so different from Hong Kong cinema, but still giving me that thrill of watching really talented performers, you know, do their incredibly violent dance. It's, it, it also like John Wick, it's incredibly violent and abrupt. Like, you know, Hong Kong movies are often like people trade punches, you know, for three minutes and they're still and they're still ready for a photo op. You know, they're still smiling. They got all their teeth. <laughs> right. Right. Um, in the raid, uh, the, the premise of it is just, you know, some cops trapped in a building full of gangsters and they have to get out. They're just like <laughs> oh, absolutely <man>. sworn. <laughs> yeah. Right, they, right. They try to have a raid on this building that's basically like imagine if the entire mob owned this one apartment block, right? And they sent in a bunch of SWAT guys and immediately like it all fell apart because they've got a traitor in their midst and all the guns are quickly fall out of the world. No more guns, right? <laughs> so it's all sure. down. Sure, it's just like the guns, it's their cyberpunk 2077, all the guns clip through the floor, fall out of the world, and you're down to your fists. And so, you know, the main characters just have to punch their way out of this apartment building. I, and it was just... It, it reminds me of the, the uh, comedy thing XKCD did about River Tam beats up everyone. Where it's like, forget the plot. It's just kicking and punching for an hour and a half. <laughs> right, right. It was so good and just so different from the other martial movies, martial arts movies I have loved over the years. And really made me cringe in a way movies haven't in a long time. Where somebody takes a big hit and instead of them, you know, flinching like in a Hollywood movie, in a Hong Kong or Hollywood movie, you kind of feel the damage that they just sustained and fights are very short kind of like in john wick where he just like runs through a room and shoots 10 people in the head this is kind of that where he runs through a room and kills six different people with improvised weapons and they're all really short exchanges and right. it just like every Every 15 seconds, you're like, ooh, and you sort of like grasp your own hand or like put your hand on your, thro on your own throat. Like, oh, that probably hurt before he died. <laughs> He's going to feel that at the morning if he lives that long. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, second movie, and that m movie did not start a, a new wave of Indonesian martial arts movies. It did get a sequel, but it didn't like, it wasn't this new wave of, 
of imitation, right? Yeah. Well, it didn't have the dog like in John Wick, so. Right. Second movie I think is underrated is Dread. This is a Judge Dread movie. It starred Carl Urban. Um, I, I really want the subtitle to be a Judge Dread movie, but I I know it's not. <laughs> Dread, a Judge Dread movie. And um Oh my goodness, it I am so disappointed this movie didn't this movie came and went. I didn't even know it existed until it popped up on Netflix. And that makes me angry. I didn't know, I didn't hear about it when it was in theaters, didn't see any advertisements for it. It just feels like the movie was dumped on Netflix and I know it did terribly. It bombed. And it's probably my favorite movie of the last 10 years based on a comic book. <laughs> You know, I like it better than any of the Marvel movies. I said they're all good. But wow, Dread really stuck with me and was super fun. And oh, I just loved it so much. And it, there's another movie. The Raid, Dread, and Die Hard are three classics. And all of them are like the protagonist is stuck in a building with a bunch of bad guys. <clears throat> like there might be enough of these that we could call this a genre. It's almost like uh, it's almost like a battle royale movie, right? It kind of is. Yeah, just survive, survive these waves and waves of people trying to kill you, or like a TD. Um, and the other movie I think was underrated, which is you kind of saw this coming. Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I loved it. It was a visual feast. Had just the right amount of moodiness and mystery. Um, and it didn't do very well. I don't know that it lost money, but it wasn't the sort of thing that Hollywood was like, oh, we better start making these by the boatload. Yeah. We've, we've missed a, a niche market. No, you guys haven't. You, you know what sells. Right. So, um, and I also have a short list of movies that I hated, but Paul, I want to hear your answer. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid that I'm the wrong person to ask this kind of question. My I my view of movies be. in general, yeah, my view of movies in general is that they are all advertisements for something. Uh, so you say if that it's like an it's advertisement for, well, if it's an advertisement for uh, political stance, then it's propaganda, right? And but if it's an advertisement right. for uh, social stance, then it's social action or something. And so, without getting political or religious, uh, almost all of the movies that are produced are advertisements for things that I already know that I don't want to engage with, and so I don't watch almost any movies. Wow. It just feels like a loophole. It's like a security loophole where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to patch this. I don't want to be, I don't want people backdooring into my subconscious. So anyway, I don't I hardly watch any movies. So yeah, the, the closest I've, I've come to watch action movies is that I subscribe to the Everything Best About channel on YouTube, which is enough for me. It's plenty. Everything Great About, you mean? Yeah, yeah, that guy. The opposite of the everything wrong with guy. Yeah, yeah, inspired by and, and diametrically opposed to. I really love Jeremy from Everything Wrong With, and people get angry at him. I mean, there are, you search for him, and you'll get him, and then you'll get 50 other videos talking about how he's full of shit, he's a jerk, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and, yeah, because his nitpicks are unfair. And I think, yeah, they're, they're totally unfair, but I enjoy sort of running through the movie and seeing a bunch of rapid fire observations anyway, even if I disagree with a lot of them. Sometimes they're just funny or, oh, I didn't notice that. Or, huh, that, that's, that's a funny way to interpret that scene. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's almost like the, the riff tracks, but condensed version or whatever 
where it's just like and, pointing out all these things where it's like, eh, maybe it's funny, maybe it's not, but at least someone noticed something funny. Right. Like riff tracks, their first draft where they just sort of notice a bunch of things and they're like, okay, and then we should write a joke here. But he never does that step. He just observes. <laughs> like, forget the joke. They <laughs> just point out things. Yeah. And right. I don't know if he came up with them. I'm, I'm sure that he has drawn a lot of stuff from TV tropes where, you know, you find a thing that's generally a negative aspect on TV tropes, look for it in the movie, that kind of stuff. Um, but the everything wrong with movies have kind of solidified, I guess, or popularized a lot of the the uh, the trope names, which is which I kind of find fun because it's like a little language, just like a mini dialect almost. Hmm. Anyway, so no, I don't have any favorites, least favorites. I guess uh, the new Star Wars movie, the first one. Uh, I watched it with my family, and I was like, "Oh, this is, this is propaganda for something that I'm not interested in engaging with." So I never watched any of the any of the other new Star Wars movies. Same thing with the Hobbit. I I never watched the Hobbit movies because I was watching Lord of the Rings, and I'm a big fan of the books. And uh, the last Lord of the Rings movie just sat with me wrong. Like it didn't didn't sit well. Uh, again, right. visually stunning and amazing, but like. Uh, it was pushing some things that I was not interested in receiving. And uh, so I never watched the Hobbit movies until my friend that I was talking about in the previous question uh, that works on stuff and you don't really know what he's doing had uh, the Hobbit movie watching party. And uh, he invited a bunch of friends over and we all watched like the the hatchet version or whatever. Like they cut out all like a whole bunch of characters that weren't in the books or whatever apparently the hobbit movies like strung together nine hours long and so like they whoever right. edited this down edited out like hours and hours and hours of footage and got it down to like four hours and or four and a half or something and so For we watched that and it was movies. just grueling yeah yeah all, all three kind of like cut together and uh it would even cut down it was just grueling and like so long and so i mean there's amazing shots and like it's amazing production of course but uh, it's just like, oh, man, oh, it takes so long. And you can't, like, stop in the middle. Actually, I think we did stop in the middle and have dinner. But uh, it's not like reading a book where you can, like, put it down and, you know, pick it back up again. There's pacing and there's there's narrative threads and there's visual stuff and there's the music is ongoing. And so it's it's a very different experience. And uh, I'm glad that they, those movies were made, but it, maybe it would have been better if they weren't. Okay, well, that leads directly into my list of negatives. Uh, my list leads off with the Hobbit movies, which I've only watched most of the first movie, and I totally agree with your the word you chose, grueling. It was so uncomfortable and so not entertaining. I got a lot of the way through the movie, and I realized I don't care. I'm not excited. I don't care about any of the characters or the plot. And these visuals aren't doing anything for me because I'm just numb. It's just... Yeah. It's like riding a roller coaster, but, you know, you're as you're flying by, there are great, you know, vistas that you get to see for four seconds before your neck snaps in the opposite direction and you go in, around another bend, <laughs> another vomit-inducing bend. And it was just Oh, so, man. I, a four-hour roller coaster? Yikes. That would right, be grueling. Right. Oh, it was... It, it made me angry. Um, another movie... Now, I don't have many movies that I hate on this list just because I, I tend to turn them off. And so, right, right. You're past the age where you need to watch something so you can engage with the youths. Right. And now you have streaming. Like in the old days, you rent a movie. It's like, hey, I spent money on this sunk cost fallacy. I better sit through it. And, <laughs> right. And, and I'm or, or a movie to... theater. You go into a movie theater, you pay oh, yeah. the thing, you're sitting down. If you're going to leave, you have to like get up and get back in your car and drive all the way home. We actually did that once, actually. We, were, we went to see, uh, what was it? Despicable Me. And we started watching it, and we were just like, oh, this 
is not a good movie. We even saw it at the cheap theater. We paid like two bucks each or something, you know, and we're just like, nope, we're, we're done. We're going to get up and walk out of this thing. Anyway. <laughs> right. So, but I don't have that many movies on here. And in fact, I, I kind of usually feel like I shouldn't badmouth a movie unless I watch the whole thing. Um, but here are a few of, from the last 10 years that I hated. Self slash less. I love the idea of this. I watched it because of the cast. It's Sir Ben Kingsley, who is one of my favorite actors in the world. I love this man. He is absolutely a genius. He's always a delight to watch, and the idea is that he's dying of cancer, but he's this incredibly rich guy. And he gets this new experimental thing that can transfer your mind into a new body. Mm -hmm. And they tell him, and they tell him, look, don't worry, you know, this costs most of his wealth, but hey, you know, you keep, you keep a few million for yourself. And he gets the body of Ryan Reynolds. And the people selling him the thing are like, oh, this person is like, we, I forget what the lie they told him is. Like, this is a clone we grew in a tank, or, um, I, for, I forget, or maybe they say this is somebody that's brain dead, so... It doesn't matter. They're just a body donor. This is no different than taking a kidney. Something like that. But he transfers into the body of Ryan Reynolds. I love this setup. It's so interesting. Here's like this 80-year-old man who's now in the body of this young, sexy, fit man. Like, imagine, imagine somebody born in, you know, the 1930s. <laughs> Who's who's suddenly in the body of a 30 year old in the modern world and sure all all the weird things like there's something that an old Man would say that everybody would be like yeah, that's that's the kind of thing you'll hear from old-timers But would sound really weird if a 30 year old said it right Sure, sure. It's a fun writing exercise Yeah but they all, it was almost like they didn't want to explore that part of the movie. Like, Ben Kingsley did this really heavy New York accent that Ryan Reynolds did not do. So there's like nothing, it's just like Ben Kingsley left the movie and Ryan Reynolds show up. And there's no, there's no body language, there's no mannerisms, there's nothing to connect these two. It doesn't feel like this is that old man in a new body. Oh, man. Yeah, you could have done so much with that. There's so much there right. to work with. And it didn't really explore what it's like to be an old man in a young body. I mean, it does. It shows him banging a bunch of hot chicks. Like, okay, that's something that might happen, but that's not the most interesting thing. <laughs> right, and that's also but not you... something that... It, like, a, an old person... Yes, the libido goes down, but they also have a an, a perspective that sees beyond right. that immediacy, that that purient physicality, and you can you can be in a situation where you have the capacity but not the desire, not because you're incapable, because you're uninterested. And it would have been interesting to have them in that kind of situation and like having a thoughtful discussion or like something, you know, to draw a, a contrast where where otherwise you're just doing fan service, right? Which I guess is what they were doing and probably right. what sells. What I thought is what I was expecting is, okay, he hooks up with this young girl. There's a crack like she takes her top off and he says something like, oh, I haven't seen anything like that in 40 years. And I was like, okay, okay, here we're, we're kind of leaning into it. But that's it. He doesn't like find her <laughs> incredibly immature and irritating the next morning. You don't just oh, have yeah. her like, you imagine how, you know, you're an 80 year old man and suddenly you've got this 27 year old that thinks, you know, like every young person thinks they know everything and has got all these opinions that are uninformed and weird opinions of things that you lived through. I mean, I run in. Oh, sure. Into this too. Sure. It's so, yeah, there's so much material. We could do a whole die cast on this. That's, that's great. Right. I'm glad they, anyway, I'm glad they made that movie and, and really knocked it out of the park. 
<laughs> right, but instead they were just like, he's in the body of Ryan Reynolds and he discovers that they're bad guys and it turns out this body actually used to belong to some soldier and now he has all of the guy's reflexes and instincts and he's just this unstoppable killing machine. Even though he's okay. been in an, an I thought they were going to take it in like a, a face-off direction where like they transferred right. the original owner out and now he's got to like get his body back or something. But no. No, he has to keep taking drugs to suppress the personality he supplanted. And spoiler, at the end of the movie, he realizes this is wrong. And after he's done killing all the bad guys and avenging this guy's death for him, he stops taking the drug and lets Ryan Reynolds have his body back. And allows himself to die after, you know, risking his life and leave it living hedonistically for a year in Ryan Reynolds' body. He's like, but here, you can have it back. It's like somebody stealing your car and then driving it for a year and then giving it back. And I, the, the whole morality of the movie was just stupid. And it's called selfless. Like, there is nothing selfless that he did in this movie. Uh, he did the bare minimum that a human being should do. <laughs> you chose not to murder this man by continuing to live. Morally, you chose not to murder somebody and take their kidney. And so you died. Like, that's that's the selfless act that, that Ben Kingsley did at the end. So, that bothered me. We spent more time on that than we should have. The other movie I really, really hated from the last 10 years was Snowpiercer. Everybody loved this movie. And I hate it so bad. It's a, it's a class warfare allegory. And it is so blunt. Like, the only way to... In, to interpret the movie that makes sense is to understand that everybody in the movie is behaving in a way to mirror class, this allegory of class warfare. Like the train, the, the, it's post-apocalypse and everybody lives on this train, the world is frozen over, and the train just goes around a loop takes one year for it to go all the way around this loop. Like, where the fuck is there a loop that takes a train a year to go around it? On it's planet like Earth. planet. <laughs> right. <laughs> how, how fast is this train? And, and what do they eat? It, the, exactly. And then it, show, it tries to show that by the, the poor people who live in the very back of the train finally begin to fight their way forward. Like, they've had enough being poor and they... They go forward and they realize they've been eating Stop, insects. stop. No, it's too much. Stop. Okay, it's a bad movie. Is there any other movie you it's, hated? It's so bad. And no, nothing they did or about the setting makes even the slightest bit of sense. And it, and because, it, you know, I really agree with um, what Tolkien said about allegory. I, I disagree. I I forget he said I disagree with or reject allegory in all its forms. And so this was the most bluntest allegory I've ever seen on film. Okay. Um, other movies I hated, Good Day to Die Hard, just because it's not a Die Hard movie. It's just, they turned, um, John McClane is supposed to be an everyman that gets caught up in extraordinary circumstances and it's a sequel to one of the greatest action movies ever made and it's just a big dumb loud movie that makes no sense where john mcclain is now an invincible superhero even though he's a 60 year old man like he when he was 30 he was a frail he was just fragile you felt like any one of these gunfights could end his life and in this movie he's jumping off of buildings and falling like 20 stories into a swimming pool and just climbing back out and just going on to fist fight 10 more Russian mobsters. And it's just like, you should have just had Arnold Schwarzenegger play this guy as the Terminator. <laughs> as the term I was just thinking that that sounds like the Terminator movie. Right. And so it wasn't really that offensively bad. It's offensively bad because of what it could have been or what it should have been. Right. Mm. 
like it's a sequel to a great movie so it should have and it failed on everything the original was great at that was a very long segment i apologize we blew we blew most of the show on that that's okay deadly dark deserves it it's true thanks for the question deadly dark um i'm gonna skip we might come back to this but i want to skip ahead dear diecast i suspect i am only the latest in a long pie long line of people to tell you that I too am one of the nobodies who listened to the last episode. Yeah, a lot of people said, hey, I exist. I watched, I listened to this show. I am curious though, as to how much traffic actually changed for the last week compared to episodes released at other times. And is there any other interesting seasonal variation in traffic you have noticed? Keep up the great work, Henry Chadban. Um, okay, so the interesting thing about this question is that I don't know. Um, over the last, a couple of years ago, I switched to, my, my server went down all the time. I'd get a bit too much traffic, somebody would link me, and my poor web server would just crumble under the load. And that was frustrating, especially when I'd have a video do really well on YouTube. And the resulting traffic would take down my blog because that's the whole point of making those videos is to drive people to my blog. Right. So I got a cloud solution, right? Where it, it's um, a distribution network. So now it handles my content. The problem is that now... If you look at the analytics on my website, it's like nobody visited, you know, because the caching service downloads a copy of it and serves it to all the people. The only, the only people who show up in my logs are people who themselves leave comments. And that's like a couple hundred people. So, mm, so if, right. if you look so it only at, directs we, them to your, your actual web server when they're interacting with your server directly, if they're just getting content, they get it from the cloud server and you never see it. Exactly. And to get access to those analytics, uh, you have to pay a monthly fee and it's, and there's nothing else you get with it. Like 20 bucks a month just to be able to watch your traffic numbers, which incidentally is an unhealthy thing. Like, you don't want to sit there. In the past, I've found if, I, if I'm if i too aware of, of traffic trends, I will start to feel guilty for not maximizing it, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a game. And, it becomes a game where you're trying to yes, win. Right, exactly. And that can push you into clickbaity behavior. It push... I mean, we, we see game game sites fall for this all the or just regular regular websites all over the net fall for the, they fall into this pit they fall into this rut that's the word i'm looking for they fall into this rut where they realize holy cow this one top 10 list got you know a whole week of traffic in one day we should do more of those and then that eat that type of content eats more and more and more of the site until you're just this content mill of easily consumed shallow content and i don't want to do that i want to make you know i want to make this the kind of content i'm hungry for and so in order to do that i have to not watch the numbers all the time it would be okay if i peeked at them once in a while just to to get a vague sense of where I am. But watching it on a day-by-day -day or post-by-post -post basis is really bad for me, right? And there's no mm. way to do that except to, you know, pay $20 a month to have access to it all the time. And that, I think, would be very unhealthy for me. So I have to be content in my ignorance. That's also really weird. Like, metrics are so... They gather them anyway. It's, a, it's like a side effect of hosting. So anyway, I, I don't know. That right. is kind of strange. I, well, it is like it's a free service. And you think about how I'm using gigabytes and gigabytes of content from this cloud service for free. That's wonderful. And, you know, 
if I was a business and I was trying, you know, if I was a proper gaming site selling ad space, I would need those analytics in order to get advertisers interested in my site. Right. So, so I think it makes sense to charge for these numbers. If you need those numbers, you're probably turning a profit. You're probably running a business. And if it's just, just for your cat curiosity, yeah. uh, the diecast video on YouTube gets around a hundred views a week. Uh, until we did the Star Citizen episode where it got like 450 views. Um, and then it's kind of been trailing off. So like the one after that was 200 views. And then last week's was 120 views. So still above average, but like half each time. So I don't know if that's like the holiday slump or if that's uh, what. But it's it's certainly been going down, but it's mostly been affected by that uh, that Star Citizen video. To answer the other question, uh, all of these impressions I'm going to tell you now are based on, you know, years ago. I noticed the pattern um, right around Christmas, traffic absolutely tanks. Traffic is usually suppressed over the summer. People aren't spending as much time indoors at their computer. They're out mm. and active in public. They're out more. So traffic goes down um anytime you get a day off from work any bank holidays will cause a dip in traffic but uh, you know bank holidays can often be made up the next day like oh this monday is i don't know martin luther king day or something and so that day would be like you know a third of my traffic would vanish but then the following tuesday the very next day would be a little bigger than usual like People come into work after the long weekend, and the first thing they do is take a coffee break and come to my website, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I get it back. So those are the trends that I've observed over the years. I don't even know if they're still true, but it seems to be, if, if just going by the very rough metric of comment count, and, you know, if you're a reader, you can see that number just as well as I can. You know, oh, this post got a lot of comments and this one didn't. Now, of course... If I say something controversial or a controversial topic gets started, that can turn into 100 comments right there that have nothing to do with site traffic. <laughs> but sort right. of... Right. But, you know, in, the, in a broad thing, if you observe the trends, you will notice, hey, bank holidays and, and time off, big holiday times and summer seems to be an overall less. And, the other uh, thing that you get from comments that you don't get from metrics is that comments weed out all the bots and the bot traffic and the vacuuming, data vacuuming visits and uh, all that stuff, which has true. just become a larger and larger share of the total data. I run a website and so I, I've seen these numbers growing over the years and it's just now it's like 10 to 1 uh, bots and data vacuuming versus anything approaching normal human patterns. I do get bots that post to my website sometimes. And they always, I mean, it's always super obvious. It's always old posts. It's always like 10 comments at once. Hello, I am to this website <laughs> right. for the first time today. I am so glad for such content. You know, salutations from, and then, you know, fill in the blank. And it's super obvious because the wording, you know, they're all different distinct messages, but they're obviously the product of the same bullshit Markov chain generator. They come within two minutes of each other from the same IP address. And it's usually, you know, I get up in the morning and like, oh, 10 of these and I just delete them. And it's no big deal. But you realize somebody has to, I forget what you call it when you actually run your bot through a web browser instead of... You know, so that it does all the JavaScript stuff. Yeah. Um, I like don't know, somebody because wrote, I've never done that. but Right, but somebody wrote a very sophisticated spam bot to actually get through all the layers of protection to properly fill out the form. I have things to trip bots up. Uh, there, are hidden f there are hidden fields in my comment 
form that you fill out. There's hidden fields that you can't see. Oh, if yeah. But if you fill them it, out, it's like, nah, -uh, you're not a real person. Exactly. And so this bot is, you know, been programmed or adjusted. And I rename those fields sometimes just so that if the bot is on the lookout for, oh, don't fill in the address field or whatever, you know, some stupid nonsense field, uh, I change its name, the, the bots are still aware enough to get around it. So somebody figured that out, did all of this, but they couldn't be fucked to give it reasonable messages. Well, hey, it's possible that this isn't a bot at all. Maybe it's like some sweatshop over in India or something. They just pay people to post comments and see which ones stay up and then sell that data right. to the real bot guys. It offends me because with a little more work, this would work. I, it's possible to post a comment that is a spam comment that I will scroll by. Like, if it just seems, you know, people fill in the website field with their personal blog. I don't click on all of them. Um, I don't click on your website unless you kind of become a regular. And I'm like, all right, this person's been around for a few days. I'm, I'm curious what this person's, you know, all about. And I'll click on it and maybe it'll be their deviant art or their GeoCities <laughs> or, you know, whatever they got. But I'll be like, oh, sure. okay, now I know this person a little bit better. It should be totally possible to post a reasonable... If you've got somebody in a sweatshop, they should be able to comment coherently, e even if they just mention the topic of the post. Like, they find some age-old thing on Dragon Age, and they say, oh, Dragon Age is still one of my favorites, I still play it today. Like, there. Almost no effort went into it, and that would go right by me. I would just like, yeah, legit comment. Yeah. I, you know, I think though, I think what they're testing for, they're not actually trying. So this, here's my theory. I have no evidence for this except for, for thinking about it, because I, I get those kind of comments on my blog too. I, I think what they're actually doing is they're not trying to post a link to something and like get the link directly. They're, they're doing one step back from that. They're trying to see which blogs are protected against the kind of attack that they want to do. So if this is a real person, then what they're doing is they're going around all these websites and posting these comments, and they have to be weird comments that no human would post, or you wouldn't be able to find them again. And then they go right. to some other other company, or they sell this list of all these websites to, and they're like, hey, look, you can search the web for this weird thing, this weird comment, and you'll find like 400 sites that have this comment on their blog. And that's how you know that we were able to put the comment up because we did that. So anyway, it, I think maybe that's what they're doing. Um, but who knows really for sure. I get offended by it. Not because I hate spam. I mean, I do hate spammers. But I get frustrated because it seems like they're doing a shitty job. And I could do it better. <laughs> right? If only I was less principled. Right? Right. I mean, I would never do this job, but if I did, I could kick your ass. This this isn't even hard. <laughs> I'd do this in a weekend on a dare. Why are you uh, so terrible? Well, you could always write bot to write comments that link back to your blog. I should do that. I just I'm going to make a bot that goes around to wind at random gaming sites and posts long, barely coherent bitch and moan comments on Mass Effect. <laughs> just copies them out of your big article. <laughs> yep, and it's just this bot that needs to tell the world how bad Mass Effect is. I like it. All right. I want to cover this comment, but it's super long. Okay. Let me see if I can boil it down. Okay. Hello, Diecast. I remember Seamus complaining earlier about the difficulty of finding good games on Steam by just browsing and searching. Now, Steam has introduced an early version of a new browsing capability. It allows for searching by categories. Uh, do you think that this is the correct approach to finding gems in the mass of games? And if you were the king of Steam, how would you design the browsing and searching experience? Alpaca. Thank you, Alpaca. Alpaca? The whole... Alpaca? Well, it might... Uh, it's spelled differently. Anyway, thank you. Right, the, the whole thing will be in the, in the website. 
All right, I see you have you you put some thought into this, Paul. Well, I, I went on to Steam because I didn't know that they had a new search feature, and uh, I started poking around and trying things, and I went into the it right up at the top of the search thing. It's like these number of things were excluded by your preferences. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I clicked on my preferences and it's got this whole thing of like, you know, do you want to show sex games and do you want to allow profanity in the content and all that stuff. And uh, then there's one thing that has the tags, like excluded tags, is you can exclude certain tags from the searches so that you don't have to see games about whatever, you know, trains, maybe you don't like train games. And... Um, but then I noticed that right below that the tag thing, it said, based on the products that you marked as ignore, you may want to consider ex consider excluding some of these tags. And then it has some examples of tags that I might want to exclude. So the tags that Steam thinks that I should exclude are building, action, single player, space, and indie. <laughs> That's like a list of everything you want. <laughs> right, look at how, how did it do that? And I know how it did it because I've bought a bunch of games on other platforms. And when I go in to look at Steam, I exclude all the games that I already own. So oh, Steam has right. taken this to think that, oh, he doesn't like these games. He never wants to see anything about anything associated with RimWorld or Satisfactory. Doesn't like that stuff. It's all garbage. We're going to give him <laughs> football games or something. And so we, Steam is trying to figure out, well, what does he like? You you like hentai right. girls? No. You like, <laughs> you like, you like bro shooters? No. Jeez, this guy's a hard nut to crack. I can't figure out what he likes. Right. So, and to be fair, it doesn't automatically exclude those, right? Like it, it suggests right. it. And so... Fair enough, Steam. You you got me wrong, but at least you didn't jump to conclusions. Um, but that's just about as far as I got in their search thing. I I don't really use the search feature on Steam. I just kind of let the algorithm suggest stuff to me and, and say no if I don't like it. So, yeah. What's your approach? Okay, I can't believe you... You mentioned the same thing that I ran into a while ago. Um... I noticed I was seeing a lot of, hey, this game, um, we're not showing you, or something like three games in this list are hidden because of the choices you've expressed in the past. And it was the same thing. Steam was like, I'm not going to show you sex games. You've made it clear in the past you're not interested in hentai boobies. Which, fair enough. I have been like, in the discovery queue, I'd be like, no, I don't want to see that. No, I don't want to see that. And I realized it was right. hiding those and it's not, titles from It's not from because it. they aren't good boobies, like, they're great, but I just, like, I've got a wife, okay? Just back off, right. Steam. <laughs> right, I don't, I'm just not in the market for these games. But I realized it was hiding them from me, which, good on Steam, okay. I expressed a preference, and it correctly interpreted that. But then I was like, but I kind of want to be aware that things are out there even just... To have my finger on the pulse, I want to be aware of what's big, even if it's not something I'm interested in. So I turned it all off, and it was really abrupt. Like, the face of Steam <laughs> changed really fast for me, and I became aware of how prevalent hentai content is. Like, imagine you go into a bookstore... And it's just a normal bookstore <laughs> to you. And then one day you mention to the to the cashier that you're over 21. And she pushes a button and all of a sudden the shelves are filled with adult books and, a, you know, smut and porno mags and everything. Like, that's what it felt like. Like, holy cow, I've been wow. not seeing half this place. And I, I have no shame to anybody that's into this stuff. I'm, you know... I wouldn't want to see it banned. I don't look down no. on people that like this stuff. I want to make that really clear. It, all of my oppositions are religious, so I'm not going to go into that. But yeah, from a purely commercial standpoint, yes, it's a it's a valid uh, product line. Exactly. It's valid. And I, even though it fills Steam with a bunch of stuff I definitely don't want, 
I kind of like being aware of what the market really looks like. And I'm kind of... I see it as a healthy thing. Here's one of the things I found fascinating. When I was young, Times Square in New York City was a filth hole. It was just drugs, prostitutes, it was dangerous, it was lurid, it was not a place you take children. And the internet fixed that. I mean, and there were there were adult places around my town too, like it'd be a big sign advertising, you know, get your adult VCR tapes or whatever. Right. And you know, lurid pictures in the windows and people didn't like it. And they were always fighting like, Hey, I don't want to be next door to this business because I'm trying to run a family business. And the person next door is selling tits and that's bad for me. And they'd fight and, you know, try and try and run each other off. And it was super, it was unpleasant and it exposed this content to people that did not want to see it. And the internet came along and all of that stuff vanished. And the guys that wanted to go into the adult bookstore don't need, don't want to do that in public anyway, right? You right? Why would you want you, that? Right? You 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 don't mind if somebody sees you going into the grocery store, but if you're going into the adult bookstore, maybe you don't want to see your neighbor when you go in there because he's you know one parking lot over getting ice cream or whatever. That's it. That's it. In my town, I think it was a Dairy Queen right next to the place that had all the adult movies. So it's children and families. <laughs> and then on the other side of the same parking lot is porno tapes and strangely enough, bicycles. It was actually a bike shop that like had this side wow, business. Real kind small of town. Right. Well, no, it was the bike shop began offering tapes and then that ballooned. There was such a demand. The, the oh, bike okay. shop. It, it did the whole the joke you were making about Walt Disney World turning into a strip club, except in exactly. real life. Right, exactly. It was like, hey, we'll just throw these tapes. You know, maybe they were into them or they had a few and they wanted to rent them out or whatever, however it worked. But then there was apparently a pent up demand and that became their biggest money maker and the thing is that would feed on itself like now if i want to get parts for my bicycle i don't want to go into this place because people will think i'm going there for pornography <laughs> right so i'm going to right so the bicycle business dried up right anyway the internet cured all of this uh, pornography just vanished and that let people get it in privacy and that let People who don't want it don't see it. It's as if it doesn't exist. Times Square is now Disneyland. It's like you bring the kids. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, we're we're simplifying, obviously, but yes, that's a huge right. factor. The only the only sex shops now are like sex toys, and those are around, but they're much more rare, and they're also much more tame because the people who want to get that stuff don't need the porn as well, and so. There, they can just be like a dildo store, which not great <laughs> right. to have next door to Dairy Queen. Why are there always next ice cream shops? Like this is weird. Right. I don't know. I was always curious about that. Like, oh, it was okay on this hill. You you come up to the top of the hill, and the order of the buildings was thus: the high school, the Dairy Queen, the bike porno shop, and the king's restaurant in that order so this was uncomfortable Weird. for everybody right yeah this was raps bicycle center i think it's still in business and i think now they just sell bike stuff again but it was right between a bear, dairy queen and kings and near a high school so everybody was just irritated at each other <laughs> Like, right, and they can't even school. be like, you've got to close this business down because it's a bike shop. And like, come on, guys, he just sells this stuff on the side. Right, on the side. Uh, and I I never went in there because, you know, well, I, actually, I did ride bikes for a while. I could have been a customer, but I would have gone to anywhere but there because I don't want to go in there and everybody think I'm going in there to buy porno. <laughs> My, 
my, you know, pull into the parking lot and there's my pastor waving at me from the Dairy Queen parking lot? <laughs> Probably not waving at that point, but yes. Scowling. One of the interesting things culturally is that this is uh, this is really based on the um, the Protestant roots of the United States because if you go to other places like for example Japan um, they've got pornography like in the the Seven Eleven and it's right. everywhere and it's, but it's not in your face because it's just like it's another product that they sell um, but it is like it's out there and there are sex toy shops and stuff and like they're they're blatantly advertised they're you know right out in in public and it's not like it's a big deal it's just like well this is another aspect of of their their commercial offerings you know and um right so that the aversion is is pretty cultural and so it's interesting that a lot of these these uh coping mechanisms crop up because of that but yeah yeah right there's there is awkwardness of people see you going in there that you would not get if you were in another culture go into it in another right. country if somebody sees you going into the sex shop they're not going to be f freaked out in the same way that if they see you going into a drugstore they're not going to be like oh, you're on medicine <laughs> you know it's just like oh i saw bob right, at the right. sex shop yeah it, uh, or like if imagine like if you're overseas if there was like gun stores everywhere you could just go in and buy guns and like you saw someone going in there you'd be like are they gonna shoot somebody oh oh no but right. in the united states it's like no it's just, there's gun shops and like you go in there to buy guns and like in bullets and whatever to, or just talk about guns maybe you just want to go in there and you know talk to people about something you're interested in right i was um i was a few doors away from sportsman's supply which was gun store that's where i lived for 12 years in in the aughts and uh the you know it was not this weird like Ugh, a gun store everybody around there of course was just like hey cool i don't have to go so far to get a gun or get a scope or whatever it is i need for my gun but you're right if if you built if you transported sportsman supply into any california suburb it would be weird it would raise eyebrows in the same way that a porno shop would here. It is fascinating. So, long way to say that Steam is doing their job, I guess. Yeah, I... Oh, I'm sorry I took the, us on this long digression. I, when no, I no, see we got that, there together. Yeah, when I see that on Steam, even though it's not something I would buy, I kind of feel good knowing, hey, it's good that stuff like that survives. If that's on there, yeah. then I then I don't have to worry that something I like might be missing, right? If there oh, was sure. somebody, the, 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 yeah, that the the scolding uh, moralistic prudes haven't been able to drive stuff off of the off the platform. Right, right. It's a canary. Hmm. I also wonder if. Steam keeps track of the stuff that it's shown you in the past, and when you turned off those settings, it was like, oh, there's this whole catalog of content that I haven't exposed Seamus to. Here you go! Well, what surprised me about this is when I looked, when I said, show me everything, I was completely floored by how much of the top sellers was do dominated by pornography. Like, here, I thought it was this obscure, like, once in a while, you know, a hentai game will crack the top 50. And no, it's there are always a couple in the top 10. Like, this is... And you're not normally aware of this, because review sites, normal. Like, you don't go to IGN or Kotaku and see these games being promoted and reviewed. So, if it wasn't for the Steam listings, I wouldn't even know that these games existed. And not only do they exist, they're incredibly popular. And that's fascinating to realize. Did not know. I have all my mature content turned completely off. So, like, I don't get right. whatever the chainsaw attack game. I, and none of that stuff shows up for me. So it's right. kind and of the got opposite. To. You've, got, you've got young kids that use your computer all the time. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm logged in, I don't want them to stumble across something uh, disturbing 
or or scarring or whatever. And so I, I just have it all turned off. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I understand that. But yeah, I kind of enjoy being able to see everything and like, that's really interesting. So I have no suggestion for Steam and how you find things. I think they're doing as good a job as they can. Like, I, I'm very negative towards the YouTube algorithm. I think it's horrible. I think it pushes things that... I think it obscures things that it doesn't like. The, the platform has an agenda, right? The platform has things that it wants you to watch and things it does not want you to watch. And... I don't feel that in Steam. Maybe it does, but I don't get that feeling when I look at Steam. It's like, wow, this game is super, super raunchy. It's a hentai game about banging your stepsister. Okay, if this is on your front page, then I get the feeling you're pretty hands-off about stuff. Right. It would be interesting to do some research on the tag browsing, because I think that's what this question was originally about, is like searching, uh, by narrowing it down by tags and types and things. And um, it'd be interesting to see like what fraction of all those different tags are in those different mature categories. Like, because I'm looking right now and indie is way at the top with like 47,000. And then way at the bottom is story rich with only 5,000 showing for me. But like, is that because all the porno games are story rich or what like what's the yeah. why is that that dichotomy there that is interesting story rich yeah i don't know enough about the genre i did play the i mean i played a porno game once <laughs> what was it called honey pop yeah yeah and that it was, was a an good experience. connect four or connect three or whatever <laughs> yeah it, it was a good game although it did make me really uncomfortable so i haven't like gotten any other games from that studio like whoever runs that studio is a really good game designer but i i haven't followed up on their other games there's one where it's about you manage a porno website and everybody says it's a really good i'll bet it's a great management game but i don't want to run a porno studio <laughs> right Oh, no. I, I would like something with a similar sense of humor that has you managing like game reviewers and you could understand you could decide if you want to hire the inflammatory clickbaity bastard that's always starting shit on social media or you could you know just try to hire people that do their friggin job and you have to balance the needs of creating controversy with the needs of you know pleasing advertisers and that, that could be a fun management game. But I, I maybe you could just a do a, a reskin of the of the porn site management game and make it like a, it's the, what's the opposite of a nude pack? <laughs> the opposite of a unporno a game. That's a fascinating idea. Unporn. You realize that would really offend people. <laughs> uh, wait, wait. I think it's opposite. The opposite of offend people. Well, it would offend people that like the original game. How dare you remove these quality boobies? It would also probably offend the people that you were trying to appease by making that mod, because, like, right. how dare you, you engage with this content at all? Right, right. you'd still have to buy the, the porno game and then load the mod. So you'd have people, <laughs> your, people on your friends list would see you playing this thing. Right. No, no, it's not like that. I only play the modded version. The clothes pack. I only play with the clothes mod enabled. <laughs> this is... I love this idea. I love Victorian this Victorian costume mod. <laughs> the Quaker mod. Everybody puts on lots of clothes. Yes. Yes, the Mennonite... You figuring out what gender the, the people Mennonite are. Hack. They're wearing so many clothes. Oh, man. All right. Well, I feel like we've done a show. In fact, I think we've done too much show. We've done I it again. Too much show. Three weeks in a row. It's becoming a habit. Right. New Year's but resolution. I mean, I think, Stop overrunning the time. I think specifically this time we maybe, maybe did 10 minutes of show we're going to regret later. But I don't know. That was a fun conversation.
Nah, it's okay. My pastor doesn't listen to this anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for the questions. We've got a couple left. Wouldn't mind answering more next week. We'll try and actually cover more than three questions. Um, if you have a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamelessyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. does listen to this though my wife i should have thought of that before i opened my mouth okay isaac edit out all the parts where paul talked about his porn collection